Hello, glad you can join us. In this episode, we are discussing fraud detection, explainable AI, robotic process automation, and igniting your future. Stay tuned. The Institute of Internal Auditors presents All Things Internal Audit. More than $4.7 trillion are lost annually to occupational fraud worldwide, according to the latest data in Occupational Fraud 2022, a report to the nations produced by the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners, or ACFE. Rising interest rates, inflation, increased unemployment, fears of a global recession, the lingering pandemic, remote work, and an increased adoption of and reliance on digital technologies present the perfect incubator for fraud. For internal auditors, it's important to recognize the signs of fraud, but also understand how to partner with certified fraud examiners to detect and deter fraud. Here to discuss the benefits of such partnerships are two professionals with a foot in both worlds. Christy Ziegler, CFE, CIA, and CRMA, is a general auditor at CITCO and sits on the ACFE Board of Regents. And David Dominguez, CIA, CFE, CISA, CRMA, is Director, Audit Compliance at ETAFOS and a member of the IIA's North American Content Advisory Board. Hey, a big welcome to both of you. Let's jump right in. Christy, what is this partnership all about? Well, hi, and thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here talking about two of my favorite topics, internal audit and fraud. What's the partnership about? It's about sharing information and insights. A big component of the partnership is focusing on collaboration between fraud examiners and auditors to provide more information and context that can help members of both teams better protect their organizations against fraud. It's important to observe the boundaries that internal auditors provide constructive insights that help organizations identify and mitigate fraud. However, while internal audit is an effective part of fraud detection and deterrence, finding fraud is not the job of the internal auditor. A certified fraud examiner is specifically trained to identify fraud. As a result, it makes sense for the two types of professionals to collaborate in a partnership that serves the organization's best interest. In my experience, though, many companies don't have a dedicated Department of Fraud examiners. Therefore, internal auditors are even more important in the fight against organizational fraud. The partnership between these two skill sets answers the call for internal auditors to be more keenly aware of red flags and to recognize fraud when they see it. Thank you, Christy. David, what does the part in the collaboration look like for the internal auditor? Thank you, Jeff. Well, first, let me just mention how excited I am about the partnership between the ACFE and the IIA. This is truly a natural collective and collaborative effort with benefits to members and practitioners. I am so, so glad really to see it become a, a reality. Uh, on the collaboration, the first part is somewhat preventative. Internal audit can support anti-fraud efforts by providing assurance or advisory services over a variety of controls designed to detect and to deter fraud, uh, internal audit knows the intricacies of its organizations and their industries, uh, its last landscape, and it's truly positioned to support management and the oversight bodies in their fraud mitigation efforts. Uh, fraud often occurs because of poorly designed controls and weak governance uh, undermining the organizational processes. Nearly half of the cases in the ACFE survey were due to lack of internal controls or override of existing controls, uh, auditors by default ought to consider the potential of, for fraud risk, um, practically every indi individual engagement and, and the adequacy of internal controls in the areas they examine. We all know that when anti-fraud controls are in place, there tends to be lower fraud losses and quicker detection of fraud. Studies like the ACFE's report to the nation have revealed that over many years. And, and, and to Chris's point, most organizations do not have a dedicated fraud department, but even if they do, I will dare to say that the call for internal auditors to contribute to that fight against fraud via those assurance or, or, or advisory service is not only indispensable, but obligatory. Now, Christy, earlier you mentioned boundaries between the roles. Why are those necessary? Because you need the experience and expertise to conduct a fraud investigation. The internal auditor should not be expected to have the expertise of a person whose primary responsibility is to investigate fraud. Such investigations are best carried out by those experienced to undertake such assignments. 
As such, internal auditors should not investigate fraud unless they have the specific experience and expertise required to do so. Internal auditors use their expertise to analyze data sets, they identify trends and patterns that might suggest fraud. Where the experience is not available within the audit team, the organization should consider recruiting or engaging those resources with su sufficient knowledge and expertise outside the organization. It's important to also mention, though, that the collaboration with internal audit should have with the second line groups like compliance and legal when it's time to engage them if fraud is detected. But overall, organizations should not expect internal audit skill sets to include fraud investigation. Instead, internal audit should support the organization's anti-fraud management efforts by providing the necessary assurance services over internal controls designed to detect and prevent fraud. Okay, David, what is the ultimate goal of the collaboration? We we'll love to say the goal is to eliminate fraud completely, but, but that's unrealistic. Organizations face numerous types of frauds, a variety of motivations behind them, and a wide range of perpetrators. Also, some fraud schemes are the same, but the ways in which they are conducted might change. They may be different due to uh, newer technologies or, or other disruptive factors or circumstances. So I see this collaboration as, all, as a way to stay ahead of the game. Uh, see, uh, a key component is about mitigation and early detection to the reduce losses. So the more knowledgeable that people are at all levels, management, the board and staff across the company, the better they will be able to deploy reasonable and pragmatic mitigation efforts and to identify fraud or red flags that indicate its existence. This collaboration is about knowledge sharing and, and capacity building, sharing good practices and drill them into emerging risks, sharing practical tools and techniques and even tips about real life stories. Uh, I'll tell you, I have learned so much over the years from fraud experts in law enforcement, former FBI agents, for example, attorneys, data scientists and behavioral scientists, just to name a few. Fraud examiners with their own niche expertise or, or dedicated themes. And I use some of that knowledge they shared with me up to this day. So while we might not be able to eradicate fraud, by combining their unique skills and experience, internal auditors and fraud examiners can make a strong contribution to the organization's overall efforts around fraud risk management. Well, combining strengths and collaboration is just what the ACFE and the IIA are doing. This month, they're launching a year-long webinar series to help participants navigate six emerging technologies and threats that impact both anti-fraud professionals and auditors. They'll be addressing blockchain, crypto and KYC, virtual remote work forever, non-fungible tokens, we know them as NFTs, deep fake technologies, ESG and regulatory reporting, and the metaverse. Christy Ziegler and David Dominguez, thank you for joining us on All Things Internal Audit. Perhaps we'll see you in March at GAM in Dallas, just down the road from Houston. Thank you, Jeff. Hope to see you there. It's great to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. There are people who assume leadership is solely associated with a title. The truth is, a title has less to do with true leadership. Duran Dunn, an award-winning accounting and finance professional and elite sprint athlete, also known as The Freeze with the Atlanta Braves, shares a few of his winning coaching strategies and techniques with Jamie Shine. Hi, I'm Jamie Shine, Corporate and IT Audit Manager at Quick Trip, and I'm joined today by Duran Dunn, a Managing Director for Advisory Services at Grant Thornton. Thanks for joining me, Duran. You gave the keynote presentation here at the Ignite Conference on building leadership skills entitled Ignite Your Future, which was very well received. So first of all, thank you for that. Now, Absolutely. let me ask, do most people struggle with transitioning into leadership roles? And if so, why is that? Look, I, I think that people actually struggle more than they realize or than they would admit in terms of transitioning into leadership. Key reason is, most people aren't necessarily trained and developed and thought about leadership. Think about your courses in college. Typically you're going through college, you're taking courses in accounting, management, finance, um, economics, all that. Maybe you're touching on some things around leadership, but in terms of pragmatic, practical leadership that you could bring inside the workplace, you don't get it. You start school, you do a couple of years, you get promoted and all of a sudden, you're a people manager. Have your managers, have your supervisor been kind of coaching you along the way? 
And so oftentimes that's the difficulty around transitioning in leadership. That's such a great point. Now, in your presentation, you talk about 10 different key points of leadership, and they're not necessarily linear steps, but 10 characteristics that we need to implement. Do you want to tell us a little bit more about those? Yeah, I've embodied kind of embracing myself. And what I've essentially done is taken the top 10 fundamental things that I believe every single person should have in your leadership journey, whether you're a junior person in your leadership kind of starting out or you're seasoned. And so when you think about those 10 things, when you think about being decisive, having the executive presence, having fun, and it's not an understatement, you've got to have fun, Um, being empathetic, right? Being a servant leader, all of these are key fundamental characteristics to being a, a successful leader, an impactful leader. And quite frankly, I don't think you can say, hey, I have nine of them and one of them I don't have. You have to have 10 because you can't say, hey, I have nine of these characteristics and then say, hey, I'm not really empathetic. You're going to lose people. You can't say, hey, I'm 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 a service, you know, I'm service oriented. I have servant leadership in my leadership style to my to my team. Hey, I I believe. Right. I I see it before it actually comes to fruition and then say, well, you know, I, I don't really trust my employees. Right. Like it doesn't work like that. You need all of these 10. And quite frankly, like you said, it's not linear. But you can't have nine or eight and not have the rest of them. They're fundamental to every single leadership. Now, three that I thought were particularly interesting that you mentioned are trust, empathy and fun, because a lot of people say that they don't see that in their audit leadership. Yeah. So how would you respond to that? <laughs> so I'll probably primarily agree. <laughs> <laughs> I'll probably agree with most of that. I believe and have seen and experienced leaders who do have that trust and empathy and fun, but they're far less compared to supervisors who actually who don't. Um, and, I, I, and look, I think the reason for that is simply because folks get busy. They're in the rut of kind of getting the work done. Um, and sometimes you kind of just lose the edge of having fun. And when someone says, hey, I'm not doing well or going through something personal where you should be expressing some type of empathy, you know, maybe you pick up the phone, maybe you send an email and then you leave it alone. You aren't continuously following up. Um, and I don't think folks are being mean about it. It's unintentional, right? People are well-intentioned. But in terms of like consistently practicing and making it a muscle memory of saying, hey, I need to make sure that I am consistently demonstrate, demonstrating trust in my employees, making sure that I'm in consistently empathetic, listening to the employees. Um, we just don't do it often enough. Um, and I think today, when you think about how we operate in today's world, how fast things move, the speed of change is faster than ever to- any, as, as ever before, we need to make sure that we are specifically dialed in on trusting, showing empathy and having fun at work. I know that all the best leaders I've worked under have had those three characteristics. So I love that those are in your your list of 10. Now, I want to end with talking about how important you feel integrity is, that that's a foundation to everything else that leaders can do. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? That's your morals, Mm -hmm. right? That's uh, that's simply how were you raised? What's your belief system? What's your value? And so obviously as a core principle, from our profession, professional basis, that goes on unsaid. Um, there's no wiggle room in that one. You have to have that box check. And I really believe that again, it's, it's really who you are as a person. It's what you do, what you say, when no one is looking, when they're looking, okay? Irrespective of where you are, are you consistently demonstrating good integrity? Are you making good decisions? Because that's your values. So without a doubt, we need that more than ever in the profession. When you think about uh, a lot of the stories that we've seen on the news where leaders have demonstrated uh, uh, poor decisions around the integrity, we need it more than ever. So it's critical to our profession. Well, thank you so much for sitting here and chatting with me today, Duran. Thank you so much for sharing your insights, both at the keynote opening session today, as well as right now. I know I personally have learned a lot and I think everyone else has as well. So thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. What is your internal audit dream job? IIA members were asked just that at a recent gathering. Some of the answers may surprise you. 
If I could work anywhere in internal audit, it would probably be either with a wildlife protection service or something within the animal realm because I'm a big animal person and love the nonprofit organizations. I would choose the New York Yankees. It's my favorite sports team. I'd get to, you know, maybe win a World Series ring. That's what I would do. I would like to work for Google. I think, I think it's a nice workplace. I saw many things on, on the internet about Google work environment and I like it. I love it. Uh, it would be working for Burna Boy. <laughs> I'm his big Burna Boy, I'm his biggest fan. Seeing that he's a well known artist right now, it'd be very interesting to see where all the finances and all those things go to. So I'll be interested in the part. Maybe have my own consulting practice. It would be to uh, be an internal auditor with any of my Philadelphia sports teams. So be it the Philadelphia, the, the Flyers, the Phillies, or the Eagles, um, do a job I love and also enjoy the teams I love. Liverpool FC soccer team, best team in the world. If I could be an auditor, well, I'm a diehard Cubs fan, so I'd probably be an auditor for the Cubs, and I'd say that uh, we probably have enough room uh, in the salary cap to get some better players. And now for a bit of challenging fun we call In Focus. In the 2022 Pulse Report, CAEs were asked to consider how they would prioritize additional funds on technology. Can you guess how they ranked the following software categories in priority from highest to lowest? Artificial intelligence or AI software, robotic process automation software, RPA, audit management software, data analytics software. No Googling. We'll be back with the correct answer in just a few. With growing workloads and diminished resources, RPA, or Robotic Process Automation, is gaining increased use. Chris Denver and Michaela Tillman speak with the IIA's Jonathan Jones and share insight on how to implement and audit RPA. Hi, I'm Jonathan Jones, Director of Member Experience with the IIA. At Ignite this year, we had our guests Chris Denver and Michaela Tillman of Crow LLP share their presentation auditing robotic process automation while enhancing governance. Thank you for joining us today, Michaela and Chris. Thank you for having us. Thank you. So you begin your presentation by saying internal audit must adopt robotics process automation now. Why is that urgent? Yes, absolutely. I would say that bots are being used across all industries, especially the financial industries, but internal audit could really leverage bots to provide lift and service cutting down time because it's really more of a resource balance. You know, mm -hmm. there are fewer and fewer accountants year by year to support growth. And so you need two resources, people and technology. The people aren't there. So you definitely have to lean on technology and we're seeing that out in the world today. Absolutely. Can you briefly describe how bots are used to provide lift to internal audit departments in the performance of the annual audit plan? By Lyft, we mean having the bot perform services that are typically done at the staff level or highly redundant tasks. So bots can do work paper creation, they can do SOX testing, they can do a number of things that any human can do in a computer with much less time and without the need to take a break. And so they're a really valuable resource. And I'd add to that, that pretty much any task that is, think about it like a low wattage task, Right, so mm -hmm. it's something that's very redundant, uh, requires uh, not a lot of thought, but a lot of time and execution. Those are really good examples of ideas that you wanna put a bot on it, right? So that we can drive more efficiency, free up staff to perform at a higher level. As Michaela noted earlier, there's a distinctive, and you, folks may have heard of this, there is a resource shortage in, in, in audit and in accounting in general, and that's not going to go away for a generation. So bringing in some RPA, automating these very low wattage tasks to free up your staff to basically do more with less is a key to your survival going forward. Bots are running in systems and processes that are scoped into the annual audit plan. How does an internal auditor audit these? Great question. Yeah, I'll take that one. So uh, the challenge with internal audit is that we're finding more and more often that the company that we're auditing uh, has systems or processes, for example, say like the account to record process they'll might have one or two or three bots that are operating in that whole cycle. So our problem then becomes, well, how do we audit that, All right? So I was speaking to a CAE recently who said, look, you know, we've got a bot that's running in our accounts payable process. I said, well, how are you handling that? And she responded, 
Well, we'll audit up, you know, from the beginning of the process up to where the bot is, and then kind of skip over the bot, and then we'll audit from the end, from the bot to the end of the process. And she can do this using her, nor, you know, what I'll call normal internal auditors. I said, well, what about this sort of donut hole that you're talking about here mm -hmm. in the middle of this process where you've got this bot and you're, and she said, honestly, I don't know what to do with that. So then the question becomes, you could test inputs and outputs in sort of a traditional IT audit perspective to make sure that the bot is doing what it's supposed to do. Okay, and that's a, that's a very valid approach. One of the things that Michaela and I talked about in our session was, how do you ensure that the bot is not doing what it's not supposed to be doing? Uh, and the example that Michaela gave during our session was, hey, look, we've got a bot that processes accounts, uh, excuse me, processes payroll, and it does a really great job. But at the same time, it also saves down a copy of the entire company payroll to a shared directory that every employee can access. So that's a good example of the bot doing something really bad, but it's still doing its payroll objective well, but it's doing some, something else that it really should not be doing. So then it's really important, I believe, for the internal audit team to find a resource who understands the bot code to come in, audit the bot, to make sure specifically that it is not doing what it's not supposed to be doing. And that can be an internal resource, or it could be an external resource, depending upon the sophistication of the department. Okay, so we have a company that has a mature RPA program. So what does good governance around the automation program look like? How would I audit that? Great question, Jonathan. So the good governance around any kind of an automation, well, automation is just another IT component, right? So as much as you have good audit protocols around the rest of your IT infrastructure and other systems and processes that you're using that are part of IT, so should the bot be the same way. The RPA program should be the same way. So you want to make sure that you've got a good internal governance structure set up around that, that bot program. So generally what we recommend is to have some sort of a center of excellence or a COE mm -hmm. established to maintain and run that and, and really own that bot process. That way the audit team can come in and audit the COE, make sure that it's doing what it's supposed to be doing according to its charter and its, its standard operating procedures or protocols, make sure that it's producing good results, that the bots are running effectively and efficiently, that they're achieving ROI, and that that reporting is coming out to interested stakeholders on a regular recurring basis. Yes, and if I could add to that, I'd like to say that segregation of duties can be considered a segregation of access. And that's something that we highly recommend from the start, whether you have a citizen development program or otherwise. Michaela and Chris, thank you guys so much for joining us today. We really appreciate your time. Yes, thank, thank you. Jonathan. And now the answer to the In Focus Challenge, which posed the question, in the 2022 Pulse Report, CAEs were asked to consider how they would prioritize additional funds on technology. How did they rank those software categories in priority from highest to lowest? Well, reverse this list and you've got your answer. Data analytics software was the highest priority at 68%. Audit management software was next at 54%. Robotic process automation, RPA software, came in at 34%. And artificial intelligence, AI software, was lowest at 31%. For more insightful information on the profession, read the 2022 Pulse Report at the IIA.org and look for the 2023 edition this March. Artificial intelligence is everywhere, revolutionizing business and enabling an array of applications that can improve the daily lives of people. But as people and businesses rely more on AI, there are growing questions about how these systems make their decisions. Enter Explainable AI, or XAI. To tell you more about this topic and introduce our guest, I've invited an actual AI-powered avatar to conduct the interview. Welcome to The Big Idea. Are you sure you're an avatar? You look so human. Thank you. You look human too. I am an avatar and I'm very pleased to be here. Okay, can you tell our audience about how XAI works? XAI provides a view into an AI system's black box where its decision-making takes place. By making AI decision-making more transparent, XAI helps organizations prevent harmful outcomes and build trust with the public. That transparency also makes it possible for internal auditors to audit AI systems. But don't take my word for it. Alan Cross, Chief Commercial Officer at AI business solutions firm Diveplane, is joining us to share more about XAI and how internal auditors can use it. Welcome, Alan. My first question. Why is it important to know how AI algorithms make decisions? I think with the 
proliferation of AR as more and more people are using and organizations uh, are using AI, what's become really apparent is to understand the why. Why is the AI making a certain decision that it does? So it's really now turned focus on looking inside the black box, as it were, uh, and breaking that open. Um, and it's it's certainly now a trend that those opaque type algorithms that just have data thrown at them and an answer produced really is no longer acceptable. Um, it doesn't work. It, it doesn't work when a healthcare system can't understand um, why, a, why a certain drug has been recommended. It, it doesn't work if um, a list of parolees is produced, um, but you don't really know why they've been selected. Uh, it doesn't work, and if you get a, um, a, a, a credit overdraft rejected and I get it approved without understanding the why. And I think now, it's, it's now is that time for um, explainable and understandable AI so people can gain the confidence that the AI is actually acting in a way that's fair. I think you hear ethics being thrown around a lot. Um, I, I certainly think people just want to be treated fairly. Um, if I'm treated the same way as you and you as I, um, I think most people would sort of like say, yeah, that's, that's reasonable. But if you don't have the ability to explain um, what the algorithm is doing, how it's reached its decision, then there's that uncertainty. And with uncertainty, you get mistrust. And I think that's the problem that a lot of the traditional black box type um, platforms uh, are suffering with now, that people aren't willing to accept that. Can you tell our audience how explainable AI works? Fundamentally, it's how you would expect it to be in the sense that an understandable AI platform will show how it works. It will tell you, this is the data I have used to make that decision. And this is the weighting I have given to that, um, to that data. And this is the confidence I have uh, in that prediction. And I think that that last point is really important because a lot of AIs out there will give you an answer. And not only will it not tell you how it's derived that answer, it won't tell you that fundamentally it was a guess. It really didn't know. And it gave its kind of shot in the dark, um, here's my best answer. Which again, if you think about some of those um, use cases I alluded to early, that's kind of fundamental, really important. So what understandable and explainable AI has done is really opened up um, that box and said, right, look inside and I will show you how, I, how I've derived the answer. Um, this is the important information that really drove that answer. And this is the stuff that really didn't impact the answer. So that users then can say, actually, that makes sense. That, we hear the term human in the loop, um, I think that's fine. Uh, you, you want to have uh, the accountability still left with someone that, that kind of signs off on the decision. So that for the humans to be able to say, that makes sound sense. I didn't know the answer, but I can see the logic behind how that decision has been made. I have seen the data that has been used and I'm happy with that, um, with that answer. And what understandable AI then allows you to do is to say, hey, well, do, you know, if you don't like that answer, or, you, you, or there's some data in there that's really impacting the answer that you don't want to use, then don't use it. Just edit it and take it out. And that leads on to really what understandable AI is is really avoiding. A lot of the black box AIs now um, just rely on more data. Give me more data, but only certain types of data. And you're seeing um, now a, a behavior where organizations are, uh, are making decisions about what data to feed the AI because they don't know what the AI is going to use. So they'll take some of that really sensitive data, uh, like let's say gender, age, race, and they say, well, we can't use that. 
you can't use that data because we're not sure how the AI is going to use that information. So they take it out. So now you've introduced bias into your data set anyway. You've already changed the way your data is behaving. With understandable AI, you should put all your data in there and allow the system to say, these are the features and the conviction that I'm giving to those features in my decision-making process. How could XAI help organizations with the legal, compliance, and trust issues associated with AI? Yeah, I think um, any good auditor, auditor likes a, a chain of custody. They want to look back through the, the process. And at any time they can't do that, there's automatic red flags. Uh, and I think understandable AI now is a platform that auditors can embrace because they can, they can in some respects, control it, but understand it and accept it and appreciate it. And most importantly, and trust it. If an auditor can trust that there has been a process that um, the, the, the platform has gone through, and at any time they can audit that process, I think they can embrace the technology. Uh, so if you are looking at financial records, for example, uh, and you're looking for anomalies in financial records, where it might just throw up a black box type technology, you might say, um, well, here's some cases you need to look at. And the auditor is going to say, okay, why? Um, and the black box won't respond. It will just say, no, look at these cases. And the only way that um, a black box can work, you know, will enhance its decision will be throw me more data. Well, that doesn't help the auditor. But with understandable AI, the auditor can say, okay, you've told me to look at these particular potentially erroneous uh, transactions. Why? And the understandable AI will, will it won't talk to you, but it will say uh, in, a, in a data response, Here's, here's the data that I use to come to that conclusion. Here's data that looks very similar to um, the, the rationale as to why I said you need to look at these. Here's data that doesn't really look like that. And here's the conviction, again, the confidence that each of that feature level that I've given that decision-making process. How can internal auditors use XAI to audit the AI applications used in their organizations? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, there's a couple of ways you can do that. Um, you can audit the auditors. Um, you can certainly use explainable AI to audit the models that are being used. Um, so if, if there's models already being used by an auditor, um, you can actually use understandable AI to gauge whether or not data has changed over time, the model has started to um, drift, um, which is the term they use a lot. Um, it can also be used to, um, for example, I should imagine auditors fall foul of missing data quite a lot. Uh, and you, if um, black box type of technology is, is maybe ignoring that data, maybe not, uh, where, where there's spaces in the data, understandable AI can actually say, yeah, you might need to um, impute some data here or make sure the model ignores those null values, uh, et cetera. So I think, the auditors can at any time they use it. First of all, I'd say don't use black box technology. Number one, if, a, if an auditor is using something that they can't understand the why, don't use it. Um, but if you are because of whatever reason, um, then understandable AI can, can then kind of be the independent auditor. Uh, and we are seeing that. Uh, we are seeing some companies say, yeah, we, we, we're using this platform to to, to generate our models, but isn't it good to have a separate set of eyes on that that's independent of that model uh, that can say, hey, hang on a minute, I'm seeing something different than what you're seeing. Maybe you need to look at it. Um, it sounds like you're double handling. You are. Um, but if the decision is to use the sort of neural network GAN type technology, I think going forward, um, particularly with legislation changing, then that overhead will be required. You, you won't be able to ignore it. Uh, so I think there's lots of scope for auditors to use understandable, explainable AI to support their decision-making process. It shouldn't replace it, but it should support it, enhance it with that knowledge that you're going to understand exactly why the AI is behaved in a certain way. Um, and I would certainly guard against using any technology that you couldn't do that.
What's the next step in the evolution of AI? Wow. Um, legislation, okay. number one. Uh, the next step will undoubtedly be, uh, we've seen it in the EU, uh, we've seen it in Australia, we've seen it in Singapore, um, and we're starting to see green shoots of it here in the US as well, where um, organizations that are embracing AI, and they should do, AI should be used for good, um, but I think it comes with uh, an accountability. Uh, and, and I always call in the phrase, um, AI doesn't need to be scary, it just needs to be accountable. Do you think XAI goes well with internal audit? Yeah, it's, um, you know what, it's funny. The, the, uh, when, um, when I was approached to, to do the original interview, um, I was really excited about that because I think the internal auditing type process is almost made to measure for understandable AI. Thank you very much, Alan, for joining us on The Big Idea. We appreciate your time. Thank you for joining us. Be sure to like, subscribe, leave comments, or a rating. If you'd like to enjoy an extended version of the discussions featured today, visit the IIA.org, where IIA members get access to a longer version of this episode with more information and insights on robotic process automation and leadership. The 2023 Fraud Virtual Conference, February 23rd from 10 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Don't miss your opportunity to explore the use of technology and data analysis methods to detect, prevent, and monitor fraud. Reserve your spot at the IIA.org forward slash fraud. For 43 years, the GAM Conference has been the essential experience for audit executives seeking to be influential, indispensable, and informed. The IIA will be hosting the 2023 GAM Conference March 13th through March 15th in Dallas, Texas and virtually with a three-day experience dedicated to internal audit's best and brightest thought leaders. To register, visit the IIA.org forward slash GAM. Register now for the 2023 Analytics and Automation Virtual Conference on April 20th. Members save an additional 10% when they register by March 10th, 2023. Gaining and saving with your upskill plan. When you're making your plan to upskill your team, the IIA offers an array of group resources and training programs to meet your goals with savings. Learn more at the IIA.org forward slash group hyphen training. Thanks for joining us for all things internal audit from the IIA. We'll connect again soon.